This program is made possible by the generous support of the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. Analyzing the Complex Task of Teaching A Talk by Kelly Skeff One of the interesting things that's happened to me, and so I'll share it with you um, in my life and in my career, has been the wonderful opportunity to be at people's side who may recognize in you things that you don't recognize in yourself. Uh, people who might have a different way of thinking than you have on your own. On, on your own. And I now try to recruit uh, medical students to come to Stanford in our residency program because I claim that I tell them that at least at Stanford there are at least 50% really nutty people. Uh, and that if you're really smart what you'll do is uh, put yourself at the side of at least a bunch of nuts. Uh, people who are looking at things differently than the average person. Because when that happens and a group looks at, at themselves differently than the average person, they will look at you differently than the average person. And when you have a weird idea, they won't see it as being so weird. Uh, and it happened in about 1976 that I had an idea that this concept of working on teaching was really a viable concept. I actually got advice from people at several institutions that were, was very straightforward. They told me, you're nuts. Don't spend any more time on this. This is clearly destined for a career of, uh, of no success whatsoever. Uh, you possibly might enjoy teaching, but nothing else will come of it. And the group at Stanford were very, very different. They said to me, oh, that's kind of interesting. I had two mentors. That's very interesting. And you'd like to talk about teaching and have people listen to you? I said, yes. And they said, well, then you're supposed to learn something about it so that they should listen to you. Well, I found that quite offensive because at that point, uh, maybe like many of you, I felt I really knew a lot about teaching. And I could give advice to almost anybody uh, who walked in front of me and asked for it. I could tell them what they could do to improve their teaching. I could tell most faculty what they could do to improve their teaching. I wasn't a faculty member yet, and I had really very little idea of what faculty members really face when they're trying to do the difficult job of teaching. And so fortunately, I had people around me who recognized my own ignorance and suggested that I go somewhere and study. And unfortunately, I don't see people here from the ed school, but I would tell you that what's very interesting for me when I went to the Stanford Education School is I found a group of really brilliant scholars who were studying intensely this entire process of communication. Uh, in a scientific manner that I had never understood, that I never realized. I went to the school totally un uh, without any knowledge of how scientific and how critical the work was they were doing. To be honest with you, I was quite pompous. I was over there to kind of tell them what I was doing. And fortunately, I met a wonderful professor named Nathan Gage, who turns out to be the father of experimentally designed research and education. And he did something which I'll tell you, he invited me to learn. He listened to me for a while and then said, gee, you might enjoy this class I'm going to give called Research Introduction to Research on Teaching. Kind of shocked me. I didn't know there was such a thing, Introduction to Research on Teaching. But I went and took his class and it began to let me see that there was a real field here that many of us do not know. I would like to advertise the field because I think in colleges and universities, uh, what is going on in the study of education is not well known by the other members of the colleges and universities, or at least we don't acknowledge it. We don't talk about what happens in the field of education, although it's the bread and butter of what most of us are doing. So at least I thank you for the introduction, but I want to let you know that behind that introduction was somebody who, if left to his own devices, would not have been able to accomplish many of those things because I wouldn't have realized that I needed to go learn about them. So let me go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, I'm focusing on teaching itself. And what I put up here is a slide that says, for faculty development and teaching, are we discussing professionalization 
or are we discussing remediation? And one of the problems that I think has happened in the field of education is that when it comes to try to help somebody improve themselves as a teacher, we think that that's a role for those who are in trouble. That faculty development and teaching improvement should be saved for those people who are having difficulty. I've come to realize that that is the opposite of the truth. There is none of you who in this audience who's had to teach over the last two months. Let me see the list of the teachers again, by the way. Okay. And I'm looking here. They're varied in teaching experience from maybe three years. Anybody three or less? Yeah. And anybody 20 or more? Okay. All right. Now, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to start having you all talk at this point, but the fact of the matter is, is how many of those of you who have taught in the last six months had a challenging time during your teaching episode? Okay. Uh, notice here that some of the most experienced are raising their hands, which implies that even when you worked this process and studied it, it doesn't get easy. In fact, the more one knows about the teaching process, the more complex it gets. So I'm going to offer to you that we should begin to look at the process of teaching improvement, not as remediation, but as a part of professionalization that occur for every faculty member. A new idea for me uh, hit me about a year ago when I began to start thinking, what was I really doing working with faculty? And what I put up here is that I believe what we're doing is teaching the gifted learner. Now, we might ask, if you're teaching the gifted learner, why is it that there's been a delay, or at least not a full embodiment at institutions such as Stanford, where teachers who are on the faculty are working on their teaching? Well, something happens to you when you become a gifted learner. I would bet I would put that title of gifted learner on everyone in this room. You've arrived here in some way because you're a gifted learner. Well, something happens to gifted learners. I hate to tell you this. Gifted learners are commonly also resistant learners. Gifted learners are people who have succeeded. And in the experience of success, one becomes very confident that one has discovered how to do things. It's something that has to do with adult learning. We believe so intensely in our experience that it's very hard for us to listen to others with other experiences if they seem to counter our own. So while we are all gifted learners, what I found out is one of the reasons that I was very able to talk about problems in teaching is I'm a perfect example of a resistant learner. I also know that, I, I know that if somebody says something that doesn't strike me right, if I correctly or match my experience, if I'm not careful, I will reject them and turn them off and I will listen no more. So while I want to tell you that you're all gifted learners and that's fantastic, I also want to alert you that you're all resistant learners and that ain't so fantastic and you want to have to think about that, okay? Well, what I thought I would do in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes is uh, give you a scheme. I wonder if, is that in focus enough for all of you? Okay. I'm going to first go over a scheme for considering the process of teaching, and I'll give you a handout when you leave so that you'll have it to be able to think about your own teaching and your own learning. Some have suggested to us that the scheme that we're using should not be taught to faculty. It, in fact, should be taught to students so that when a faculty member like me has a defect of one kind or another, the student will know where they have to fill in the blanks, okay? So I'll offer it to you both as teachers and students. And then after going through that scheme, I'm gonna go through some of the lessons that we have from our own research experience at Stanford, uh, some comments from individual teachers, and then I'll end highlighting what I think are some opportunities for the future uh, in the improvement of teaching as well as the improvement of institutions. Well, to get you thinking about this, I'm going to show you a single videotape. And here I, I, I put up here on the, on the slide for you the following. The videotape that you watch, which is one from a series of tapes we use in uh, teaching improvement program, these videotape case presentations of attending rounds, which is the term given to teaching on the hospital wards uh, in medicine, 
are based on videotapes from actual rounds from Stanford and other institutions. That is, we did studies in which part of the study was for us to literally videotape the teachers wherever they were, wherever they were working. We then took the scripts and the off of those tapes. So the scripts and the settings are authentic. However, the roles have been reenacted to protect the identity of the original teachers and trainees. Now I'm hoping that with this video we can dub in the dragnet theme at that point. <laughs> now I'm always worried because is there anybody here who doesn't know dragnet about dragnet? The point is, is I, I now mention that to medical students and they or something say, what is that again? And I feel really badly about graduating in 66. In any case, nonetheless, to let you know is what you're seeing happened. The people you're seeing on the tape were reenacting what originally happened, okay? You're watching a tape in which we have a student on the left, the faculty attending physician, another student, and an intern. They're discussing one of the patients that happens to be in the hospital. Part of the problem is that the patient is just not able to go through the testing. She fatigues very easily. I think that we should do more testing so the patient gets more used to the process. Well, she does try very hard. Hmm. She hasn't had her VERs measured yet, has she? So that would be a good test because it really doesn't require that much cooperation from the patient. Now, I'm, I'm really not sure what the results would be in a patient with benign intracranial hypertension, but we really want to monitor deterioration here. So I think we should use all the tests at our disposal, including the VERs. Now take the second patient. The patient had a positive CSS serology or a borderline reactive FPA. Would you go ahead and treat? Would you give a full course of IV penicillin just to be sure? That's a difficult question because it's an unusual syndrome. Now, the VERs in this next patient are very interesting. He probably has bilateral optic neuritis, but the abnormalities are atypical. Uh, what is a VER? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want you to kind of take a good look at the freeze frame here. Uh, the interaction between that teacher and that learner. Uh, at the time that the learner, this medical student, states that he doesn't know what's being discussed. <laughs> Now, I wonder if that's happened to anybody in this room. <laughs> where you've been in a situation, either a small or a large group, where somebody's talking and you have little or no idea what they're talking about. And each of us develops a method in with which to address that particular issue. I wonder if you all think about your for yourself for a moment. If a lecturer begins to talk about something, and he speaks about it as if you know it, and you don't know it. Any idea of what kind of body posture you assume? Some look off into the distance as if, well, that's very provocative. <laughs> and others write quickly onto their pad to let it be known that they understand it and they're incorporating it into everything else they've thought. And others not, which is a very useful way to let the teacher know that you really know what he's talking about. Because if you don't nod, what is he going to do? He might call on you. <laughs> and find out that in fact you didn't know what he or she was talking about. And so we began to watch these videotapes, which in medicine and elsewhere, we didn't think this was unique to medicine. I think you all agree that this is probably not unique to medicine. That in fact something was often going on in the teaching and learning process that made many of us not be the most effective learner we could be. In fact, it made many of us take on habits and approaches that prevented us from learning. So it told us that something very complex was going on here. And what I want to do is to walk through with you a series of ways to think about this process so that you can at least catch yourself when you do those human but not very educational activities. Okay. Well, what are we talking about in this process? Well, here's something that I, I like to highlight is I think one of the reasons we have not spent more time on teaching improvement is that there's not been an acknowledgement 
about just how complex and difficult this is. It's very hard to be thinking about that student at the same time you're thinking about the content, at the same time you're wondering what's happening in the medicine with the patient, but it's true with any content area that you teach. Nobody has talked about how complex it is. And what I want to do is show you a series of slides to just make the point, which I totally did not recognize in 1975 when I entered this field. Here's a quotation I've come to like a lot. It says, what we see depends, quite literally, on the way we have been taught to see. You're in my perspective. Comes so much out of our experience in teaching and education that it's very hard to see things with a new set of lenses. And when I began in this work, I had the background of being a physician. I had a total incapability of looking at a teaching situation and seeing it from an educational perspective. I saw it from a medical perspective. The same kind of thing might happen to you. I want you to, to alert yourself to that. Well, when I began to, after about three months of watching teaching and began to realize that I wasn't seeing what was going on, we began to develop some diagrams, et cetera, to kind of point out to us what was going on. And it led us to first this diagram. What this diagram says is that in every teaching interaction like we're having right now, or in any interaction that you have when you're teaching and learning, there are three major players in the beginning of that process. There is a teacher, whether it be a person like me or you or a computer. There's somebody who's a student who's listening, who's trying to interact to learn. There's material to be learned. And in the beginning, we just begin to talk about this triangle. And what this triangle begins to tell you is that every arrow between those components is critical. For example, the relationship between the teacher and the learner at a personal level can be very powerful in teaching. I want to think back through your own experience. Have any of you had an experience where you've developed a block here? Oh, thank you. Wonderful. An experience where you have had a block an interpersonal difficulty with a teacher of yours that has made it absolutely impossible to listen to what that person has to say. You're dealing with this interpersonal interaction that has so much importance on how you and I decide we're going to stay for the rest of the show. Okay. Then this connection is very important. How does the teacher deal with the content? How does that teacher package the content in such a way that it allows you as a learner to learn it? Now many of you have been given assignments to give talks recently, I'm sure. And you're given a topic to talk about. So the night before you talk to your class about it, I wonder if you could tell which part of this triangle you're working on. Most of us are living right here. huh? And why? Because if we go there the next day and don't show that we know everything that's ever been written about this, okay, we're not going to actually accomplish our purpose. But we're not asking, gee, is the way that I'm saying it having any chance of getting into the people that are listening? So we may tell everything that's been discovered in a topic over the last 10 years, and you notice the eyes are glazed in front of you. Or, in fact, let me just ask this question. Have any of you in the last 10 minutes been in a different room in your mind? Yeah, one. How many? Okay, so you see what happens is a teacher works on content and this person is out here in River City, okay? <laughs> and if I am not asking you to think hard about this content and make this connection, then in fact this doesn't work at all. Or if I somehow with Michelle's wonderful introduction sounded like somebody you'd never want to live with. Okay, and maybe that's true. And this blocks, then you may not want to listen to this either. Okay? So these connections are very important. Well, for about the first three years of our research, we studied this triangle, and then we suddenly realized that the triangle was inadequate. These circles around the triangle became very critical. The inner circle is the room, the immediate environment in which that interaction is going on, like this room. Okay, I can see all of you, but we almost were in a situation where I couldn't have. Outside of that is the institution in which you live. Does it emphasize teaching? 
Does it say that the content that you're studying is really important? Outside of that is the society of this country. Does it emphasize what you're studying? Outside of that might well be the world. And we shouldn't ignore the fact that this outside environment affects the teacher dramatically in what they do. If you have a faculty member here who's being rewarded solely on the basis of his or her research, and they spend too much time working on this triangle, this outside environment influences them greatly. Okay. Similarly, the outside environment is influencing you. It might even convince you to choose a field as a career that you don't love because it looks like there's a market for that field. Okay. And it influences what teachers teach. Okay. So this is complex in and of itself and we could spend the next hour on just this diagram. But guess what? Teaching is worse than that. Here, as we begin to study it, it also has at least seven other categories that a teacher has to keep in their mind. And what I found out when I started is I was probably keeping one or two in my mind and didn't even know about the other five or six. I'm going to actually go through this very fast because the point I want to make here is not that you learn the content of all these seven categories because we think that that takes sometime like a month or at least two months or at least 14 hours and you don't do it in a half an hour and at lunch, okay? So don't try to master all of it, but just to become familiar with the concepts and see how complex it is. Well, the first concept we talked about there is, is the concept of the learning climate, which refers to the tone or atmosphere of a teaching setting including whether it's stimulating and whether it's a place where you can identify and address your limitations. It doesn't mean that you get so comfortable with your limitations. This is not a Northern California phenomenon, I have to <laughs> emphasize, okay? Some people say, oh, this is the place where if you've got a problem, it doesn't really matter. This is hot tub work. That's not true. The learning climate, to be positive, says that if you've got a problem, you and your teacher are better off if both of you know about it. Now, that's a different philosophy than a situation that you say, my God, I don't want my teacher to know about it ever. Okay, that's not a philosophy based on learning. That latter is a philosophy based on worry of evaluation. So the paraphrase for your definition there that I would let you think about is, do the learners want to be there? If you can say to yourself in a class, I don't want to be there, it often also means that the teacher doesn't want to be there and we have to decide how we can get that more effective. Well, how might we do it? Well, a teacher always has to think about, I'm sure this, I'm sorry, this one really went out of focus on us. You really, I really appreciate you sitting there. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we're not gonna get any better. I'll go through it and we'll, oh, perfect, thank you. That's why you're here. Second reason for organizing these talks, thanks. Well, what ways might you and I think about improving the learning climate? Well, we might think, are we stimulating or not? Are people asleep for good reason? Do we involve them? Now here I can't have each of you talk, so I have to keep eye contact with you. I've got to decide how to make sure that you're connected. Are you treated with respect as a learner? You bring up an idea and I say, well, that's really not as valid as you would think, and I go on to the next person. Somehow or other, that has an impact on the next 20 minutes, right? Is it comfortable enough that if you had a limitation, or if I did, I could tell you? You ask the question, and I as a teacher really have very little idea about the question you've asked. I might, if I'm not careful, do a tremendous amount of fancy dancing up here rather than say, you know, I don't know. Uh, almost every teacher in this room has had this experience where a challenging question from the learner, before you know it, you hear an answer going out and you look up and say, I don't have any idea what that answer is, okay? Who said that? All right. So the learning climate is critical. What else do you have to think about? Well, you have to think about who's gonna be in charge of the session. It doesn't mean that the teacher is always in charge. You as a teacher may want to set up a session where you are not in charge. You're only an observer and a resource. 
but you have to be thinking about who's in charge. Okay. And is the session efficient? Is it moving as fast as it ought to? And so a faculty member, a teacher like you, has to think about, well, what kind of leadership style am I going to use? Am I going to be democratic? Am I, am I going to be directive? Am I going to be non-directive? And am I focusing and pacing at the, rapid, at, the right, at the right pace? And am I covering material too fast, too slow? Besides that, I've got to think about the goals that I have for the teaching session. See, I have a single one for you. I only want you to walk away saying, hey, I've got to think harder about teaching. It's not as simple as I thought. But I have to ask, what is it that I want a learner to master? Do I want them to master knowledge? Do I want them to master skills? Do I want them to give, develop a new attitude? I have to think about what do I want them to gain from the experience? And those goals are called ends goals. Now, I hadn't always thought about it when I was teaching. What do I want you to have at the end of a session with which I, with which, uh, in which you and I are working? And the means goals are what activities do I need to have you go through as a teacher? So you as a teacher may say, gosh, I really want to improve my students' attitudes towards my topic area. Well, I may have a very different approach as a teacher than if what you want them to become acquainted with is the knowledge of your topic area. So we got three so far. Learning climate, control of session, communication of goals. And then I have to think about, are the methods that I'm using effective in accomplishing the goals that I set out? So if I really wanted to change your attitudes about a certain topic, mm -hmm. I know it would be very useful for me to know what your attitudes are. I'd stop this session right now and we'd go around and we'd share our attitudes about whether we think, for example, the best teacher is a directive teacher or the best teacher is a non-directive teacher. But I would have to think about the methods that I'm using, okay? Going back to the triangle, I have to ask myself, am I packaging the content in a manner in which the learner can absorb it? Or am I creating an interaction between the learner and the content in a way that they can walk away differently? Okay. Now, so if I have created a climate and I know what I want you to learn, and I've used a method that I think I'm going to, that's gonna work, I can't leave. Many of us do at that point, but you can't. Then some more categories. Evaluation. Now, let me do a little exercise with you that I like to do in groups like this. I say the word evaluation, okay? Each of you think of the next word that comes to your mind, okay? Evaluation, you all have a word? Everybody got a word, okay. Put a valence on the word. Is it a positive word? Is it a neutral word? Is it in your mind and heart and gut a negative word? Okay, you all have a valence? Okay, how many positive words? Five. How many neutral? Six. How many negative? Fifteen. Okay. That's about right. It's usually I find that about two-thirds of the people in a room, when the word evaluation comes up, have a very funny thing happening inside their body. Negative. What is, I wonder, can anybody give me one of the negative words that you had? Who, what, did you have a negative no. word? Oh, yours was positive? What was it? Feedback. Feedback, okay, we'll loop to that. So for you, evaluation meant you're gonna get some information about it to help you, terrific. How about the negative? How many, can I hear the, see the 15 negative hands? Now notice that the hands went up slower on the second <laughs> run than the first run, which is exactly an example of the process here, is that suddenly the evaluation process where you have something inside of you that could contribute to the rest of the group says, uh-oh, what they're gonna think about me. Okay, but let me see him again with full heart. Okay, what did you think of? Test. Test. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating that that is not a positive word, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? So what you realize is that we have converted tests 
into negative personal experiences. So that the concept of finding out what you've learned and what you need to learn is not a positive experience, but except for 15% of this audience. So you and I as a teacher have got to convert the concept of evaluation into something more positive, or else we will continue to spend the rest of our lives avoiding it. So you and I as a teacher have to think about evaluation. Are people mastering what we want? And are we evaluating in both a summative way, that is at the end of a course, whether people have been credentialed and successful enough to let you say, yeah, you've got a stamp of approval. And this one I would like to offer to you. Uh, how many have used this term before, formative evaluation? Okay, just, okay, good. Well, I'm, I want to spend a little time on it because about seven, about over half of you haven't used that term. Let me tell you what that means in educational jargon. Formative evaluation is the evaluation that a teacher does during the process of teaching while somebody is being formed to get information as to whether the teaching is being successful or not. Okay. So a pop quiz, if it weren't so painful, if the teacher used that to give him or her information as to whether the teaching was successful, would be great formative evaluation. Okay. During the process of teaching, a teacher might want to get checks on finding out how things are going. Okay. As I'm watching you now, I'm sort of seeing, okay, it's getting a little late. The formative evaluation is I've got to speed up a little bit. All right, you're sending the clues. Because I know that if I keep going like this, we're not going to succeed. That's formative evaluation of whether the learner's succeeding with the teacher. Now, if you realize that evaluation, in my mind, all evaluation is formative even when you graduate from here. What you've learned about yourself, you'll take in for the rest of your life. So that even the end evaluation should be seen as formative. But there are two types there. Students don't think we know the difference, by the way. I don't know if I'd, I, I'm talking about you now. Students don't think faculty know the difference between summative and formative. They think if they fail once in front of you, you remember it forever. <laughs> And the sad part about it is, as teachers, that sometimes happens. If somebody has a lapse, instead of saying we've learned more about them on the process of learning, we think we've labeled the student as either being good or bad. A very deleterious move that many of us can make, okay? I don't want you to make it. So, we come back to what evaluation meant to, what's your name? Kara. Kara? Kara? Mm -hmm. Kara said when she thought of evaluation, she thought of feedback. She thought that she was going to get the benefit of a teacher's observations. And that's what feedback is, giving the learner the benefit of the teacher's observations. I tell you, it's very hard. We've learned that this is very hard to tell somebody what they're doing correctly and what they're doing that could be more effective. There's a lot of things learned in the organizational literature and the education literature that can help you d be more effective at giving feedback that could be useful. And I think some of these are on your second sheet. So you don't have to. But yes, indeed, it's helpful if it's specific, if it's behavioral, that you tell somebody what they did rather than who they are. Let me say that one again, okay? Turns out that people do believe that when they're given feedback, it's so personal to you and me that you say, you're talking about me now, not what I did, not that I made a mistake on the test and that you want me to be able to do the test correctly, but you're labeling me. Well, I've got to be sure if I'm giving you feedback that I'm not talking about you as a person, I'm talking about what you did. And these others, I'm going to go on because we could spend 14 hours, which I'd love to do, but not today. And then we found out that there was a category that was often missing. Uh, and I'm sorry this is out of focus because it's going to be, I think it just keeps moving in and out. I found that in my teaching, I was often leaving this out. Self-directed learning, thank you very much. The learners, using the learner's initiative to drive the learning. Directed by the learner. When you and I leave a class and we're not prompted to think, what is it we're still interested in? 
and has the teacher pointed us in the right direction on where to go? We have lost a major, major um, force in learning. For the rest of your lives, most of your learning is going to be driven by yourself. If you decide to study something, you'll study it. If you decide not to, you won't. But frequently as teachers, what I found was it was so important to me to bring closure to a topic that I often would shut down a learner's desire to learn. Okay. Especially, I even have some wonderful videotapes of learners asking questions about brilliant issues that someone on the campus would have an answer to, but the faculty member would say, that's not as important in this particular topic. And you'd go around it. That's because the faculty member did not think about the learner also being a teacher of himself. All right, now let me show you how bad this gets. Under each of the categories are com components that we've touched on. Under each of the components are many behaviors that a teacher might use to advance their ability in this component of this category. What I've shown up here is in one category, four components, about 20 behaviors. Well, I never thought that a teacher ever had to worry about 20 behaviors before, and here suggests there's about 140 of them, okay, that you might think about. For example, let's take one, using an animated voice. How many of you would tend to say you naturally have an animated voice? How many? Natural, okay. How many are naturally not so animated? And how many, where were you, are there some hands that didn't go up? I'm, I'm, very, I'm very interested. Let me ask you, where would you put yourself on the animated, non-animated scale? I'd hope you see, you would, so you, most likely you would say animated, okay? You think you are, okay? And, and for some, I remember one Texan who came to our course <laughs> who said, it's easy for you to say, <laughs> have an animated voice. Now, when he, when he had his drawl, I was interested in, enough, it, in it enough that it was animated to me, you see, because it performed the psychological effect of the animated voice, which is solely to get the learner to listen to the teacher. So it doesn't matter if you're animated or not, it matters in whether the learner's attention is gotten. So we have some faculty who have very animated voices, who become less listened to because the animation and the vibrance of the voice stays always at this level. And I was described by about, uh, I was told about a very powerful teacher at one institution who had, in the hospital you teach by walking through the halls and talking, and he had a very animated voice, but when he wanted something to be remembered, he whispered. And this group would, I, would, I called it breathing teaching, because they would go, and they'd listen for a while, and then they'd come and walk. <laughs> and what happened was he changed his voice and changed how he projected himself intermittently enough to keep people thinking, okay? But what's the point here? It takes work to learn how to do any one of these behaviors. It takes practice. I held our research back at least four years because I believed that bright people who knew what they wanted to do could do it. The fact is, is that even bright people like yourselves who want to change your behavior require practice and insight into the behavior. If it weren't for the video camera, I would have no career today. Only the video camera allowed faculty to realize what they were doing because they did not know what they were doing, what they weren't doing. Okay. So there's a lot of practice to be done. Well, let me just move to show you a few lessons from our experience. Uh, it's been really an exciting time for me since 1980 now, where we started with a method to try to help teachers improve themselves that we called intensive feedback. We looked in the education literature and got every method that had ever been used that caused a teacher to change. We put them in one, okay? But what kinds of feedback help teachers change? Well. Evaluating yourself helps people change. So teachers e had to evaluate themselves on a, on, a, on a questionnaire. Seeing how other people evaluate you can help teachers change. So these teachers also saw how their students evaluated them. So right now, 
I would see how you're evaluating me at this moment. I also would see how I evaluated myself. And I would notice that you rated me lower than I rated myself. I'd say, gee, that's, that's important. I've got to pay attention to that. Or I might look at myself on videotape. Or I might bring in a consultant from the Center for Teaching and Learning to work with me on my teaching. So this method had the teacher's self-evaluation, the student evaluation, a consultant, and looking at their selves on videotape. And what we showed was is that teachers could change. We even showed that if you didn't get help, you not only wouldn't change, you sometimes would get worse. Turns out that over time, the job of teaching is very hard. And we showed that over a month, many teachers actually had a downward trajectory in what they did as teachers. When I went to the education school and brought it up, they said, that's standard. <laughs> that's standard. We know that if somebody is teaching as well in May as they were when they started in September, we've had a very powerful method for teaching improvement. So no, you will fatigue as a teacher. Then we went to a seminar method where we took two hours of trying to help people discover the categories that I just went over with you and apply it to their own teaching. That method showed that teachers of your type actually can discover many things that they want to teach and want to get better at. And then finally we went to a dissemination method that I show on the next slide just to say that Michelle alluded to and that is that we bring faculty here. Again, it's a little blurry, but we brought about 190 faculty now, thank you very much, from 90-some institutions. They come spend a month with us to either go back and run teaching improvement seminars for their faculty and residents, or teaching improvement seminars in specific content areas. And this is where uh, Lee Shulman, who was at the Stanford School of Education, has had a big impact on the education world, pointing out that the teaching of different content areas is different. How many of you teach math or science? Okay. And how many of you teach, say, social sciences and literature, et cetera? Those are two very different ball games. Okay. Even though showing enthusiasm for both of those topics is important, the literature teacher shows it in a different kind of way than the calculus teacher. But nonetheless, it's very important. So, what we've tried to do is develop teaching methods for specific areas that are important in medicine today, decision making, geriatrics, end of life care. We're now involved in developing that. And then those faculty return home and train their own faculty. Well, I want to leave you with some positive ideas. Uh, in the past, I think, we have not recognized that we can actually get better. And I want you to classify yourself on this what could be a two by two table. This is states of teachers, it could be any one of you, regarding teaching improvement. In this column, this is whether the teacher knows that he or she can improve. And in this column is whether the teacher knows how to improve. So there's a group of teachers, like you or me maybe, who are unaware of our own individual potential for improvement. And we're unaware of methods like the C Center for Teaching and Learning has of getting better. There's quite a group of folks like I was that are ignorant of both of those things, okay? Now here's the second category. You want to classify yourself. This is a class, a group of teachers who are unaware of their own potential for improvement. They're aware of the methods of improvement that the Center for Teaching and Learning has, and they have a lot of other friends that they would like to send to their methods. <laughs> okay, let's go over that one again. We did a study at Stanford with faculty inside and outside the medical school. This is a big group where a person may not really need, know that they can get better, but they really want to send everybody else over to the center to get better, right? Very hard to see ourselves as having potential for getting better, but we can sure see the other guy whenever they have trouble. There's another group that's aware that they can get better. This is growing, I think not yet familiar with the methods, and we're trying to shove everybody down here where all of us become aware that every one of us, and I've studied this now for 20 years, I know that on a given day, today, you all could give me feedback on ways that I could have made this more effective. Doesn't matter how many times you've done it. Okay. Well, this graph says, you don't know what you know and you don't know what you don't know 
until you learned what you didn't know. Okay? You don't know what you didn't know until you know what you didn't know. When we ask teachers to rate themselves on these seven categories, before they take a teaching improvement course, they replicate something shown in the field of psychology that you often will rate yourself higher on an area that you're not familiar with than you really deserve. <laughs> and only after you've studied the field will you look back and say, I wasn't quite as good as I thought. Happened in every category here. This group of teachers, before they went into the course, rated themselves very high on learning climate. The green is looking back after the 14 hours of training. How good were you really on a five-point scale? I was only here and I'm now here. This notch phenomenon turns out to be very valid and shown repeatedly when the material that you're learning is actually new to the person who's doing the rating. What we found is that teaching is really new to many faculty members. A lot of aspects are very new, okay? So I'm inviting all of you to get interested in bombarding the Center for Teaching and Learning with requests for work, okay? They'll never ask me to, say, to do this again. Well, this says that even the teachers see that they can get better. This was a group of, of pathology faculty that we studied at Stanford who across all categories after having gone through the seminars and rating themselves, you know, when you're doing research, all of you, how many of you are doing theses now? Okay, well, these p-values are going to be awfully ungodly important to you. Uh, more than they ever should be, but they will be. But it said that these teachers, looking back on themselves, found that they changed. Their students, who evaluated them from year to year, found that they changed. And five months after they had taken the course, the teachers still rated themselves as having changed. Now we think that somewhere about six to eight months, there's a great drop off in learning. And that for many of our faculty who go through our teacher training course, want to do it again and discover new things out of the same picture. Okay. Well, one of the faculty who went through that course, and I, I bring the pathology data, not the clinical teaching data, because I think it applies more, uh, that is, the, for that group of lecturers to people who are in this room. And this very, very skilled and actually uh, sophisticated and experienced faculty member of about 25 years may ha had this quote. Teaching emerged as a science of great intrinsic value. So far, I've been doing using intuitive methodology now I use a more systematic approach. And if we can help you approach teaching in the way you do the rest of your science, we're hopeful and we, I think it will actually be helpful. Now I'm giving a quote here by a wonderful author in the adult uh, education uh, literature by the name of Stephen Brookfield. And he says, learning is far too complex an activity for anyone to say with any real confidence that a particular approach is always likely to produce the most effective results with a particular category of learners. What's he saying? You can't learn one method of teaching. You'll have the best thing set out and walk into another room and lay it out and it will bomb. And you bring it back the next week and they love you. Okay? Might even be true for your jokes, huh? That one's ones that you know will happen. In fact, we tell people try to stay away from them unless you're really good. The fact is, is that a teacher has to have many, many different methods. So our approach in faculty development is to have the single goal of versatility. Not that you should teach one way, not that you should teach with some method, not that you should have always collaborative learning, not that you should always have problem-based learning, but that if we're successful, we'll help you to teach in various different ways, because all you've got to do is change the student or the content, and you'll need a new method. Well, challenges for the future and opportunities, well, they're all over this place. If we can focus on teaching, it's going to benefit the students. One of the things that I didn't realize, is it actually benefits the teachers in ways that we've never thought before. Teaching, very much like medicine, becomes an individual, sometimes isolated profession. Well, a couple of quotes to end with. 
Albert Einstein. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. <laughs> Do not believe teaching is simple. It's very complex. Break it down, but it won't make it simple. Finally, one of my colleagues, I'm sure, is quoting somebody else. He couldn't remember, but this, I think, is a wonderful quote. It is said that one can count the seeds in an apple, but we can't count the apples in a seed. This is true of teaching. When you teach one person, you plant one seed of knowledge, you can never know how many other lives will be affected. Now, for all of you, I want to kind of leave you with uh, hopefully some enthusiasm to do something like I've been able to involve myself in, and that is how do you help teachers get better? It's one thing to help somebody who's learning get better, but if you help a teacher get better, this apple seed thing just explodes exponentially. So as you all are students, if you can think of ways to help your teachers, do it. But remember, they're dedicated. In our very first study, we, when my thesis study, I needed 64 faculty to do an experimental trial. How many did I need to ask to get 64 faculty? How many? 500. Well, that's the real, that was the anticipated number. I had to ask 67. So what I learned out of this was that the people who are teaching you care far more than you know. They care far more than you know. They just are responding to stresses in their lives that are often pulling them away from something that's absolutely, I think, chromosomally attached to being a human being. Humans love to exchange ideas and teach. And I was shocked when I got, when I only had to ask 67. Three people for personal reasons would not, I mean they were being out of town or something was gonna mess up the study, but the rest 64 participated. So one, remember your teachers actually care. Two, they can get better. Three, take care of them because they're really important and actually care a lot about you. I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
the grad students became the secondary era group for us, so we now train the residents as teachers. But initially, we were more intrigued with the resist uh, what I call the confident, successful, resistant teachers, who are good. And, and for me, the most exciting seminar is getting the best possible teachers in the same room. They cross fertilize in manners that you would never believe. And I think one of our major errors is to say, well, the grad students need it, but the faculty don't. And boy, I've seen some wonderful exchanges. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to visit uh, Harvard at one point when I gave a talk, and they asked me what I'd like to do, and I said, could I run a seminar for your very best teachers? So they took the six teachers who had the highest ranking, and I had a seminar with them. I began by saying, what would you like to have me do in this seminar? And the first one said, don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. <laughs> okay. I said, that's pretty interesting. What, why, where does this come from? He said, well, I went to a teacher training seminar, <clears throat> and I was told that what I was doing was wrong because it didn't fit the model that was being taught in the seminar. He had not been to another teaching seminar <laughs> since then, you see. So that this group, once they realized that they really, yeah, we know they have a lot to offer, but they could think conceptually, began to exchange. A great telling comment by one of them, I remember this seminar so well. He said, you know, I've realized in this seminar that I'm a great teacher for really good students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid we'll have to yeah. close up with that. Thank great. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.